All right, welcome back. Today we're going to look at uh, the production function. It's in Chapter 12 of your textbook, Behind the Supply Curve, and it's pages 304 to 319. Uh, and what we're going to be looking at is trying to define what a production function is, and we'll talk about what the marginal product uh, is and what it measures, and we'll begin to look at some costs associated with uh, the market, including fixed and variable costs, marginal costs, and average total fixed and variable costs. So we're really going to begin to begin take a look at the, the supply end of things as we move towards an understanding of profit um, and loss. So the first thing we want to look at is the production function. Um, the production function measures uh, the relationship between the inputs going into production and the output that you get. Uh, from those inputs. So uh, in the most simple situation we would assume that there is one input going into the manufacturing of a single product. And so if you look at the graph you'd see that if I have uh, one unit of input, whatever that might be, if it's labor or land or some form of material, I can get a little less than one product for, for one full input. And then the more inputs I add, the more I am able to produce. When we talk about inputs, there are a couple of different uh, terms that you need to keep in mind, different types of inputs. Um, one is called a fixed input, which means it cannot be changed in the short run. And we'll talk more about short run um, in the next, next class, but um, essentially, I, if it's a fixed input, I cannot change it in the immediate future. In, in the long run, um, in the faraway future, I can make that change, but for right now I cannot. And a variable input is one that I can change. Uh, right now. And so well, you have two different types of inputs, fixed and variable. If we take an example just to get a sense of this, and we say that there's uh, George and Martha, and uh, they run a large-scale uh, farm, and um, they we're going to assume they have two different inputs into the manufacture of their farm goods. One is land and uh, one is labor. And if we think about fixed versus variable, we would say that the labor is variable. We can change the number of people who work on the farm um, easily. Today I could have 10 people and tomorrow I could, I could fire one and I would have nine and that would be simple. Um, but land is relatively fixed. I have to go through the process of purchasing land and clearing it and preparing it for growing food and so uh, that variable cannot be changed easily and certainly not in the immediate future so we would say that it is fixed. In the long run eventually I can add the land and prepare it and grow the amount of uh, inputs that I have going into, into the manufacture of my my agricultural products but for right now land is fixed but labor is completely variable. I can change it whenever I want. Uh, so for the sake of total product what we're saying basically is um, that there is a fixed input land that has no real bearing um, on my production uh, quantity that I can make right now because that's just an assumption that's there and there's no changes. So in the total product function, um, what we're looking at is the variable um, input. In this case, it's labor or the number of workers I have. And so that I can begin to chart. If I have one worker, I could cr produce 20 bushels of wheat. If I had two workers, I could produce 40 bushels and so on, creating the total product curve, which tends to go up as I add more inputs. However, you'll notice that uh, production does not continue to increase at an increasing rate. It begins to slow down. So when I add, go from one worker to two, I'm adding 17 bushels in output. But when I go from six workers to seven, I'm only adding seven bushels. Um, this begins to uh, demonstrate to us an, another concept, um, which is uh, marginal product, which, like all marginal things we talk about, is a change in one um, one variable with a change in the other. In this case, it's a change in quantity given a change in input. So how much wheat do I produce with an additional worker? And we call that the marginal product. In this case, it's the marginal product of labor because that's the input that's going into it. And the marginal product turns out to be the slope of the total product curve. So if we were to look at uh, George and Martha's farm, we would say that the marginal product of labor for the first worker is 19 bushels of wheat. The second worker, we produced 36 total bushels, which is an increase of 17. Uh, the third worker, we go from 36 bushels to 51, so the marginal product of labor for that worker is 15. For the fourth worker, it's 13, and the last worker is 11. 
then if we wanted to we could actually graph out the marginal product um, on its own graph and if we were to do that it would look like this and we would see that there's a diminishing return to the input that is that the marginal product begins, begins to get smaller and smaller as I add more inputs into the uh, the production of the good to a certain extent this sort of makes sense because if land is fixed there's only so many workers I can add uh, to the farm and expect to get more produce out of them. I mean, at some point, all of the workers are kind of trampling on the work of other workers, and it just it gets so crowded that they can't actually produce any additional uh, crops because all of the, the land is being tended, all of it has been thoroughly weeded and cared for, and there's at some point kind of a maximum amount that that would would come from uh, all of the work of the of the uh, farm hands. Knowing that marginal product uh, begins to diminish kind of helps then the supplier to make some decisions because we can begin to associate some costs uh, with each of the inputs that we're putting into the manufacture of a good. And so uh, there are two types of costs that we talk about. They're just like inputs. Um, there are fixed costs and there are variable costs. There are some costs that are fixed that we just have to pay it. It doesn't matter whether we produce anything or not. It's just fixed. Um, and then there are variable costs. Those are the costs that can change over time um, or change with my direct involvement. And we could say then that total cost is equal to our fixed costs plus our variable costs. And again, so total cost would be our fixed costs, uh, things that cannot be changed in the short run, plus our variable costs, which are the costs that we can change. So maybe the fixed cost would be the uh, mortgage on the property I'm using to farm, and variable costs for them would be the wages of the workers because I can choose how many workers I hire, and so I can manipulate the cost of my labor, uh, but I cannot manipulate the cost of my mortgage. We can then take those total costs and create a total cost curve, um, and, and this chart gives you some data um, that came out of the book and that um, you could then use to graph. So um, if we have uh, one worker and their costs are $200 for uh, wages, then that first worker has $200 variable cost. We'll assume a $400 mortgage um, for, the, uh, for the farm, and that's going to be the same regardless of how much we produce. So total costs for the uh, first worker are $600. $200 in variable, $400 for fixed. If we go to the to the second worker. That second worker has a $400 variable cost because there, there are two workers now. Um, so total variable cost is two workers times $200 of, of wages. So that's $400 of variable cost. But the fixed cost remains the same. It's $400. So our total cost for hiring two workers would be uh, $800. And you could work down all the way through that chart if you really wanted to. We could take that information and then we could graph a total cost curve, which generally slopes upward. Things become more and more expensive because we have diminishing marginal product. We take uh, more workers to produce the same amount of increase. So because each worker's marginal product is less, it takes more workers to increase total product uh, by the same amount as we increase our production. We could then say that just like with the total product curve, there is a, a marginal curve that goes with total cost and it's called the marginal cost curve. It is the slope of the total cost curve because again it looks at the increase in cost with an increase in quantity. So when I go, in this case it's cans of salsa, but if I, as a producer, a producer if I go from one can of, of case of salsa to two, then I'm going to increase my total cost by $36. Um, and that would be the marginal cost, the additional cost incurred for increasing production by one unit. Um, and marginal cost begins to slope upward, as we see, because we, when we go from the seventh ca uh, case to the eighth, our total cost increased by $180. And again, that's because of the diminishing marginal returns on labor um, that we experience. Another cost we could talk about is average total cost, and that's uh, made up of the average fixed cost and the average variable cost. So if we take the fixed costs and divide them by the total output, that would be our average fixed cost. If we took our total variable cost and divided it by our output, that would be our average variable cost. Our average total cost clearly would be total cost divided by output, um, but it could also be written as the uh, formula average total cost is equal to average fixed plus average variable. And our average uh, total cost curve we see is kind of a swoosh. 
it starts to go down until it hits what we call the minimum average total cost uh, quantity and minimum cost quant uh, output and then it begins to go up again so there's a point at which our average total cost bottoms out and then increases the reason why uh, the average total cost curve is a swoosh is because of uh, two different effects. One is called the spreading effect and one is called the diminishing returns effect. The spreading effect basically says that average, very, uh, average fixed costs begin to go down rapidly because fixed costs are fixed. Um, and so as you add more output, um, the average fixed cost rapidly begins to drop. And so that effect of the the rapid drop in fixed costs causes the average total cost curve to begin to go down and in fact the average variable cost curve um, begins to go down and approaches zero as you make more and more um, cases of salsa or whatever your output is the reason the average total cost curve begins to go up though past the minimum average total cost point is because of what we call the diminishing returns effect and what that means is that average variable costs begin to increase because of the loss of marginal product the mar the diminishing marginal um, return on labor for example uh, means that I need to hire more and more workers to be able to produce the same uh, amount of marginal product and that reality begins to overwhelm the um, the reduction in total costs caused by the spreading effect so we can put them all together and uh, one thing that we notice is that the marginal cost curve goes through the minimum point of the average total cost curve. Um, that is, the, that marginal cost intersects average total cost at the minimum cost output. Um, and so when output is less than minimum cost output, then we see that uh, that marginal cost is less than average total cost. And when it's past the minimum cost output, marginal cost is higher than the average total cost. The reason why is the think of it uh, in in terms of your GPA for a minute um, the average total cost is essentially your grade point average over the course of four years um, and so then if we take a individual course what would happen well the marginal cost of my GPA is the grade for that course so if I'm taking economics and um, say my GPA is a um, is a 3.0 and I end up with a C in economics, that means that uh, that C is less than a 3.0. Um, so the marginal cost, my grade, is lower than my grade point average. So that would drive my grade point average down. If I got a, a, a grade of an A in economics, that would mean that my marginal cost to my GPA um, is greater. It's a, the GPA for that class is greater than my average, and so that would begin to draw my average up. If I got a B in economics, and that's the same grade I was getting overall, my grade point average was a 3.0, and I got a 3.0 in economics, then it has no change. It doesn't cause the grade point average to go up or down. And it's the same thing here. If marginal cost is less than average total cost, it begins to drive total average total cost down. If they're the same, there is no change. And if marginal cost is increasing, then that would begin to bend the average total cost curve upward. For the uh, purposes of this class, um, the uh, the cost curves would look something like this, with the marginal cost swooshing, like a like a Nike swoosh, because there's an assumption that there's actually uh, decreasing marginal costs initially with uh, specialization, but eventually marginal costs go up, and that marginal cost curve will go through the minimum of both the average total cost curve and the average variable cost curve, and we'll do some more practice with these cost curves and. Uh, and move forward with what they will tell us uh, in the next couple of, of classes. So thanks for bearing through this, and I'll see you soon.